Okay, welcome back. Let's talk about transcription in eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, transcription occurs in the nucleus, which I talked about previously, whereas uh, translation occurs in the cytoplasm in prokaryotes. Now we have, uh, in us as eukaryotes, have exons, that these are regions of DNA that code for proteins, whereas, and we have introns, which are regions that do not code for proteins. Now we have these things called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SNRPs. SNRPs remove the introns and splice together the exons. Now, that's not to say that these introns are absolutely pointless. There's a lot of research that's going on in the introns and what they do. However, for making proteins, we don't really use them, so we have these SNRPs that go through and remove the bits. So this is our coding regions, and these are our non-coding regions, okay? So our SNRPs go through and cut out those, and then this mRNA goes outside the nucleus. We'll talk a little bit in class about why these SNRPs are important, but this mRNA then goes out of the nuclear envelope uh, to the rough ER where the protein can then be made. So the regulation of the bacterial gene expression um, is complex. Uh, you have constitutive genes that are expressed at a fixed rate. Okay, So these are genes for uh, glycolysis that are needed for the normal functioning of the microorganism. Other genes are expressed only as needed. So you have inducible, repressible, and catabolite repression. You are expected to know what inducible, repressible, and catabolite repression are. So post-transcriptional control. So the repression inhibits the gene and decreases the enzyme synthesis. So this is mediated by repressors or proteins that block off transcription. The default position of this gene is on, whereas the induction turns on the gene initiated by some type of inducer. This is, you don't want to make something unless you're absolutely forced to. So that induction um, will do that. We see this in alcoholics. So for example, we can take your blood work and we can look for an inducible gene that is only turned on in alcoholics. So if you go for insurance purposes, and your insurance says, for this amount of life insurance, we're gonna require a blood test. And you mark, I drink casually, but you have the gene currently turned on that says, hey, this guy drinks every night. That is an inducible gene. That gene is not made in every situation. So the operon model of gene expression, the promoter segment of the DNA where the RNA polymerase would sit down uh, for transcription of structural genes. So you have an operator segment of the DNA that controls transcription of structural genes, and then you have an operon, which is a set of operator and promoter sites and the structural genes that they control. The operon model of gene expression is an inducible operon, which means it needs to be turned on. Okay? In the absence of lactose, the repressor binds to the operator. So again, glucose is going to be much more common in the environment than lactose. So why would you make the metabolic enzymes to metabolize glucose when glucose is not always available? It is a waste of resources. So in the presence of lactose, lactose inducer binds to the repressor, taking it off, allowing for transcription of that protein to begin. This is just how that, that would begin. So this is the control. The promoter guides transcription. So the promoter can call somebody down, but if you have that block in place, nothing's going to happen. This is the gene itself that, that makes the, the lactose uh, metabolic enzymes. So that's how it works. So here we have our active repressor. Here we have our promoter. Okay, so if lactose comes down, the repressor is then taken off and the mRNA is made. Okay. 
the repressor inactive operon on when the inducer for allolactose binds to the repressor protein, the inactivated repressor can no longer block transcription. The structural genes are transcribed, ultimately resulting in the production of enzymes needed for lactose catabolism. So the operon model of gene expression. In repressible operon, structural genes are transcribed until they are turned on. So excessive tryptophan is a co-repressor that binds and activates the repressor to bind the operator, stopping tryptophan synthesis. You might be saying, why in the world are we interested in tryptophan synthesis? It just makes me tired at Thanksgiving. No, the insulin shock from how much food you ate makes you tired at Thanksgiving. That is a common wife's tale. But tryptophan is one of the most complex and rare uh, amino acids, and most microorganisms have to make their own, whereas we get our tryptophan from stuffing our faces. So if you can turn it off, bam, please do so. So structural uh, structure of the operon, again, we have our regulatory, we have a promoter, we have an operator, and we have our structural gene. In this situation, we have an inactive repressor. So if you made enough tryptophan, the excess tryptophan would then bind to the inactive repressor and say, hey, no, we're good. We're good, you don't need to make any more. And that's exactly what we see. Tryptophan is an essential amino acid for life. But because it's so structurally expensive, you only want to make enough that you're going to use. It starts to build up in your organism. You want to tell people, hey, knock it off. Now, positive regulation is catabolite repression, which it inhibits cells from using carbon sources other than glucose. This uses cyclic AMP. So it builds up in the cell when glucose is not available. So glucose, oh God, we're starving, we're starving. Cyclic AMP is normally used in glycolysis. So if it starts building up and it's not getting consumed, that means there's no glucose. So cyclic AMP binds to the LAC promoter, initiating transcription and allowing the cell to use lactose. This is a different way to get to the lactose solution. So here we have our log of number of cells, okay? And this is our glucose and this is our lactose. So as the glucose is used up, you can see that this lag time is from the cyclic AMP building up and saying, hey, 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 we need to make enzymes to consume lactose. Okay, okay, everybody ready? Yeah, yeah, Foom. good, now we started making lactose. Now we can use that sugar. This is just going through that process. Now, there are um, a surprising number of ways that you can have epigenetic control. So this is um, methylating genes to turn them off. Uh, we're going to be talking about this and epigenetic tags in lecture. I have a cool little video that we're gonna show you um, to explain true epigenetic control. MicroRNAs are base paired with mRNA to make a double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA is enzymatically destroyed, preventing the um, production of proteins. Now, these microRNAs are being used in certain drug therapies for like HIV to hopefully turn off uh, HIV particles to prevent their viral proteins from being made. So the microRNAs control the wide well, uh, uh, range of activities. So transcription starts occurring, right, of the mRNAs. The mRNAs bind to the target mRNA that has at least six complementary base pairs. And then the body recognizes double-stranded RNA and says, get out, you don't belong here, and recycles the nucleic acid. So we're trying to use this uh, to control HIV replication. There's a lot of interesting papers on that right now. So changes in genetic material is a huge area. So mutation is a permanent change. So it made it past the proofreading, it is now permanent. Uh, mutations most commonly are neutral, more likely are harmful, and then sometimes beneficial. 
Mutagens are agents that can cause mutations. Um, and we'll go over a few of those. You work with a few mutagens in lab. Spontaneous mutations occur in the absence of a mutagen. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the frequency, and it's not quite that many. Now, a type of mutation is you can have a point mutation, right? Base substitution. You have one that was a T, now it's a G, okay? That's one change. Now, that can be silent, right? Which means the same amino acid is coded for it. It can be a missense, which means um, you have kind of a malfunctioning, and then it can be a nonsense, which are a non-functioning gene. So here during replication, okay, we have our GT. Look at what should have been. This is a GC. Well, the proofreading function kind of screws up, and it goes, oh, that G should be an A. And now we have gone from a cysteine to a tyrosine. Missense uh, substitutions result in a change in the amino acid itself. So here you have uh, glycine and it's changed to serine. Notice it's the exact same number of amino acids. And this could result in a malfunctioning protein or a hyperfunctioning protein. Nonsense. So this just means you go to a stop codon. So remember those three stop codons? So previously you had, you know, four amino acids in this sequence. Now you had one mutation, which led to a stop codon, and now you have a nonsense gene. Frame shift can be the insertion or deletion or one or more pairs, and it shifts the reading frame. Uh, I'm going to have a paragraph with a missense mutation uh, so that you guys can see what the change of one letter can have in reading a sentence. So you have your DNA uh, template, and somehow uh, you get added another nucleic acid. Chemical mutations or chemical mutagens don't give you mutant powers. Um, nitrous acid causes adenine to bind with cyan uh, cytosine instead of thymine. Um, nucleoside analogs incorporate into the DNA in place of a normal base, which can cause things to base pair. Um, remind me to talk to you in class about, uh, uh, not sucralose, not aspartame. Oh, goodness. Anyway, one of the synthetic sugars is a nucleoside analog, and we're going to go over it. Saccharin. Saccharin is a nucleoside analog. So adenosine uh, nucleoside normally base pairs by hydrogen bonds uh, with an oxygen and a hydrogen of thiamine. Altered adenine with hydrogen bonds um, with a hydrogen bond and a nitrogen of a cytosine to the nucleotide. So you can, you can have chemical changes. Radiation. Ionizing radiation um, causes the formation of ions that can oxidize nucleotides, break down the deoxyribose, and UV radiation causes what we call thymine dimers. Uh, photolysis, this is the uh, separation of the thymine dimers, and then you have the nucleotide excision and repair, where it cuts out the nucleotides and causes them to rebind. So here you have ultraviolet light because you stayed out in the sun for longer than 15 minutes because you just want to look fantastic. And you have the thymine dimers. The thymine dimers are stuck to each other, uh, causes a mal binding uh, to the complementary nucleotide. Uh, it's cut out and then fixed. What's really interesting here is the spontaneous rate of mutation. So it occurs in about one in one billion base pairs, which is more than enough for us to repair, all right? Or one in about 100,000 genes. But mutagens increase that, that rate by almost an order of 20 magnitude. It's just faster than your body can keep up with it.